from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is John Cole. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is privileged to be able to host this program today. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about both the Library of Congress as an institution and the Center for the Book's program uh, in just a couple of minutes. But in order to get us started and to get some important logistical information, I'm pleased to introduce Lisa Cohn. Uh, Lisa is the Director of Program Expansion for the National Campaign to Stop Violence. Let's welcome Lisa. Thank you, and good morning. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the National Campaign to Stop Violence and to thank Mr. John Cole from the Library of Congress for hosting this event. It's a, always such a highlight of our program. As he said, my name is Lisa Cohn, and you've all met me at this point a lot. <laughs> but this morning, as we get started, I wanted to um, make mention of several people who are here. I wanted to recognize them. First of all, Dan Collister, if you just want to stand up. All of you have had um, the chance yesterday to hear from him and meet him, and again, just wanted to let you know that he is the chairman and founder of the National Campaign to Stop Violence and the visionary behind um, this program, so we thank him. We also have with us today Dr. Hassan Al Ibrahim, who is the chairman and founder, Dr. Ibr Dr. Hassan. <laughs> He is the chairman and founder of the Kuwait America Foundation, and um, Dr. Hassan, we'd especially like to recognize you for all the work you've done in education, especially education for children both here and in Kuwait. Um, and completing our distinguished guest today is Mr. Fauzi al Sutan. Mr. Al Sutan's business acumen has led him to hold many positions with international corporations and agency, and he is a board member of the Kuwait America Foundation and has been a strong advocate of our program, and we thank you for that. And thank all of you for joining us this morning in spite of the wet weather. You know, presenting the book, uh, the National Book of Writings to the Library of Congress, as I mentioned, is always such a great privilege and such a great highlight of our week. I don't know if many of you had a chance when you walked into um, the library today to see anything. We are going to give you time afterward, but I'm sure you can feel of the magnificence of this building and gotten a glimpse of just what an awesome place this is. Um, and now your writings are going to be here in the library, so it, I just think that's the coolest thing ever. You are going to be doing something that I have never done. Um, you are going to be here along with all the great writers of America. And yesterday, when you received your business cards, as um, um, Judge Woodruff said, on those business cards, it says that you are a national ambassador. And you really are national ambassadors because you are representing your city, you're representing your peers, and all of the stories that they have to tell as well. And now on that business card, you can add the title of author because you are going to have your writings in the Library of Congress. And years from now, you can come back and look for them with your children, with your grandchildren, with your great-grandchildren, because they will be here in more, in, for all time here in the, in the library. Mr. John Cole, who started the program, um, has really made this a reality, and so we thank him. John is a librarian and a historian, and he has dedicated his career toward forwarding the role of the Library of Congress in both American society and culture. His career began at the library, and he's still here, and is currently the director of the Center for the Book. Um, John's favorite two projects, he tells me, are to oversee the National Book Festival, which happens here in Washington in September, usually in the fall, and the Young Readers Center. John also tells me that he has two heroes, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. 
and Thomas Jefferson because he was actually one of the first people who was instrumental in getting the library started, and George Washington because John has quite a history with the name of Washington. He was born in Washington State, he attended the University of Washington, then he moved to Washington, D.C., he attended George Washington University, and so I think that qualifies him to be a Washingtonian. Anyway, John, we would love to turn the time over to you. Thank you, Lisa. I would just like to say a couple of words about uh, the Library of Congress itself and about the Center for the Book. And I will add another favorite to my list of favorites that uh, I gave to Lisa, and that is I'm also fortunate to be uh, the chair of a new Library of Congress program, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. And the literacy part of that effort is very close to what the Center for the Book does. We were created in 1977 by Daniel Borston when he was the Librarian of Congress as a public-private partnership to use the Library of Congress and its prestige uh, and its size and its resources and its wonderful staff to stimulate public interest in reading and in books. Uh, this was before there was a lot of attention to a subject such as literacy. So it's natural that now as the literacy uh, atmosphere, the work of literacy grows more and more important uh, that we take on this literacy effort. Uh, Lisa did mention uh, the Young Readers Center. That is a part of what we do. We administer the first place in the Library of Congress dedicated to serving young people. It's actually in this building, and I hope you get a chance to at least walk by it when you tour the building. It's uh, three beautifully redesigned rooms that are aimed for, and aimed not only at, but for uh, kids, people 16 and under, as long as they're accompanied by an adult. And we feature programming and schools, uh, visits, and it's an important part of what we do. Uh, we also have ch chapters or affiliates in every state. And one of my hopes is that we can combine our partnership with this program uh, on occasion with cities or with programs that are in cities uh, around the country. But that is really uh, for the future. But we're very pleased that we can have a part uh, in hosting you and have a role uh, in making certain that your writings, as Lisa has already mentioned, uh, are part of this great collection. I'll conclude with just a couple of words about the Library of Congress itself. It really is part of America's history. We were the first federal cultural organization to be created in our country. We were created in 1800, before the Capitol even came to Washington. Congress created us while they were in Philadelphia, but they knew they were headed for D.C. And the very first uh, building we were in was the U.S. Capitol. In fact, the Library of Congress was part of the Capitol uh, for our whole first century from 18, 1800 until the building that you are in today, named the Thomas Jefferson Building, uh, was opened. Uh, Congress needed books. Congress needed information. So they needed the library. But what's unique about the Library of Congress, a couple of things. One is it is the largest library in the world. Uh, it, uh, along with the Smithsonian and today the National Archives, really are the three big cultural institutions that watch over and promote American culture and American history. We're a little different in that we're also the parliamentary library, and there's something wonderful about that because Congress recognized it needed books and information, but when Thomas Jefferson, one of my favorite people, as you now know, uh, realized that the British had burned the Capitol with in 1814, after as part of the War of 1812, and it had destroyed the little tiny Library of Congress, he uh, asked Congress to purchase his great private library, which covered many, many different subjects, and Congress did so to get us started again in 1815. But Jefferson had an idea which has come to fruition. He said, not only would this be the best place for Congress to get information, as a parliamentary library, 
but by the way, this great collection should be open to the American people as well. We're a democracy. Everyone needs information. Everyone needs to know what is in this organization. And it turned out that after the Civil War, uh, the Library of Congress was able to develop into a great public institution as well. And it's the public side of the library that the Center for the Book and is really, in a sense, most concerned about. It's the outreach, it's educating people about the importance of the role of the Library of Congress and the role it can play in reaching out to people of all ages you know, to be part of society and to facing some of the difficulties and wonderful but difficult situations we uh, are facing as a culture as our civilization grows and matures and as our country grows. And it's through literacy and through reading promotion and through program support of, such as, of programs such as Do the Right Thing that the Center for the Book is the vehicle for reaching out on behalf of the Library of Congress uh, to let you know that we are here, that we have these magnificent resources that are paid for basically by the American taxpayer, and one of our big tasks is to share these resources, and a sub-part of that is letting people know about them through programs such as this. So again, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and it will be a great pleasure to uh, help facilitate uh, bringing your writings into the collections of the largest and most diverse uh, library in the world. I'm now turning it back over to Lisa. Thank you very much. So yesterday, Dan Collister had the chance to meet with the students and uh, get to know them a little better. And as he just told me, many of you told him, at least half of you told him, that one of your favorite activities was reading. So we're delighted to hear that, and I'm sure John Cole is delighted to hear how much reading is a part of the things that you like to do. We've had many ve very exceptional writings this year, and I wish that we could hear from all of you. But as you know, life is just full of choices, and so we had to make some very difficult ones in selecting the essays that are going to be read today. First, we are going to hear from Jason Woods, who is an eighth grader from Charlotte, North Carolina. Next, we will hear from Maya Monson, who is an eighth grader at Palm, in Palm Beach. She will be followed by Saif Ghani, who is an eighth grader from Beaumont. And then concluding will be Fabiola Paloma, who is a seventh grader from Chicago. So Jason, will I ask you to come up first? Hello. Okay. Do the Right Thing by Jason Woods. Drugs are everywhere, schools, work, business, and even churches. There is not a place in America that doesn't have any type of drug-related violence or source. For example, ask an older adult about the drug and violence that occurred during their period of growing up. Nine times out of 10, they will tell you a very long and breathtaking story, and it's only getting worse as each day goes by. Almost every child in America has had a drug-related experience. Drugs are everywhere, even in video games. With, the dr with these drugs being very common in people's everyday lives, kids and teenagers often get exposed to it, whether, whether it is at a party or social gathering. The most common drug is tobacco. Once a child is exposed, they will consider smoking as well. As they get older, they will, ex they will get exposed to marijuana, which will lead them to think it's just like smoking a cigarette. How do I know this? Because I was that kid in elementary school, along with the other 500 plus students. Even if you sit down and talk to children and adults about it, that doesn't mean that they don't do drugs or that it doesn't even cross their mind. As much experience as I've had with drugs, that doesn't necessarily mean that the thought of it does not run through my mind as well. Growing up in a single parent home where my mother is doing the best she can to raise me not to be like my father is very difficult. On April 2nd, 2005, my father committed suicide due to drugs. In fact, he died by taking a prescribed drug given by the doctor. I heard stories about my mom having to go into the crack house just to find my dad 
at the late hours of the night, having breathtaking moments every time the phone rang and he wasn't at home and saying a short prayer to herself and saying a short prayer to herself every time the phone rang and he wasn't at home. I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hold up. Okay, I'm just gonna start that. Having breathtaking moments every time the phone rang and he wasn't at home and saying a short prayer to herself, hoping it wasn't the police calling saying he was found dead or having to keep looking out the window, making sure the police weren't at the door, looking for him to have a drug raid. This really took a toll on her and my family. Me being young at the time, I didn't really know what was happening. At his funeral, I remember standing in the chair during the 21 gun salute and staring at the casket waiting for him to wake up because I thought he was just pretending to be asleep. It seemed very surreal. While this was happening, I was wondering why everybody around me was crying while wearing black with their faces puffy and colors purple mixed with blue under their skin. Now, it's just, now it seems just like a faint memory. That was the past and it cannot be taken back or undone. Because of this tragic incident that occurred, I try, not to, I try my best not to fall under peer pressure or get taken advantage of. During my adult years, I'm going to be the best role model for my nephew that I can be. My nephew was born a prenatal exposed infant, better known as a crack baby. During the, nine months of, during the nine months he was developing during his mother's pregnancy, she was raped and also sold her body for drugs such as cocaine. With this affecting his mental growth, he, can still, he still cannot talk fluently, acts like a baby, and still demands for the bottle known as Similac. Now he has to undergo continuous mental and physical therapy. Due to this, he will always be different than his peers. That's why I'm going to be there whenever he is down in need of comfort and steer him in the right path so he will not have to rely on the use of drugs just for him to get by in life. Take a moment and actually think to yourself, what have you actually done to prevent the usage and consumption of drugs? Besides, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, take a moment and actually think to yourself, what have people actually done to prevent the usage and consumption of drugs? Besides giving an hour long speech about why it is bad for your health and all the cancerous diseases it can cause. Though it is 100% correct, just by talking to people, that does not mean they will have to listen to what you have to say. The only way to actively change a person's personal opinion and point of view is by getting physically involved in the community and in their lives. Many of the ones holding seminars and protesting about the harmful drugs and intakes do not really do anything that could change someone's mind besides speak and hold up signs. What I mean by changing someone's mind is actually showing them what it's like to live a drug addicted life by taking them to a crack house and showing them the reality of what it's like to be addicted to such a life consuming product. The experience I've had with these drugs is very graphic and, and a hard and emotional topic to talk about. The only thing I can do right now at this age is tell my story about my life consuming encounters and pray that the person I'm telling listens about all the problems just when just one little consumption of drugs can do and how it can ruin your life with just one puff of smoke or snort of cocaine. Actually, this essay that I'm writing right now helped my friend last night while she was on the verge of suicide. Just by me telling my story and how it's affecting my life helped save hers. And now she thanks me every time she sees me because she did not know that I went through these incidents growing up. Every day I wake up, put a smile on my face, and try not to let the past experiences derate me and make me feel any less than myself, all because of one little intake of cocaine that my father consumed. I try to see it as a cry for help. Just because he did not get the attention he needed does not make him any less of a true hero he is. I never knew that this common drug could affect my life like it did, and now I will continue my life growing up happy and drug free. Thank you. by Maya Munson. I watched as he hit her over and over, pounding his fist into her face, back, arms, anywhere he could reach. The sound was sickening. She yelled out in pain, trying to grab or hit him, but she was too slow. Tears streaked down her face and she went limp and just gave up. I was shaking and crying, screaming and pleading for him to stop hurting my mom. Yet all that did was make him focus his attention on me. He yelled at me and then started hitting her again while I ran up to my room. This was my life. I wasn't even six years old. One day, I went to the neighbors and was molested. I was told not to tell anyone. I, was, I felt absolutely disgusting, but I was told not to tell, and that's what I saw my mom did every day, 
every day, yeah. <laughs> so why was I to be ashamed? I was only six. I remember when my mother slit her wrist with a knife and blood was pouring out of her, but her boyfriend wasn't helping. Once again, I wasn't even six and I was crying and trying to help, but my eyes were blurred and she wasn't able to speak properly because of the substance abuse. I was put in my room by him and stayed up crying until I fell asleep. I guess you could say I've been dealt a pretty repulsive set of cards. And though it has affected my life negatively, it has also helped me grow. I have depression, anxiety, and borderline personality disorder, as well as a bunch of bad habits that are hard to overcome. Though I am working on overcoming them. However, thanks to my past, I can help others with problems of all kinds. I want to be a psychologist for severely abused children. Bullying has taken a toll on my life. It is inevitable no matter who you are. However, it amazes me how low people will stoop to engage in unacceptable behavior to satisfy their own needs. I mean, we are all going through the same things. Our bodies are changing, our voices, our interests, our friend groups. How does that make anyone better than anyone else? Youth violence, as well as any other type of violence, is routed back to many things. Broken homes, social networking, gangs, substance abuse, poverty, peer pressure, ignorance, and many more. All violence is routed back to something. Teens with mental illnesses tend to show a marked propensity for violent behaviors. Once you start, I know how hard it can be to stop. Violence overcomes you. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, about 32% of teens have been bullied or have been bullies. Those teens are more likely to skip school and start fights. Without knowing the causes, how are we to stop youth violence? First, we need to be educated. Violence is hard for you to stop by yourself. Trust me, I've tried. There are a few things that you could do to help. Violence is a serious issue. If you see someone getting bullied, step in. Now, I'm not saying go get yourself hurt. I'm saying if you see a situation escalating, get someone to go help the person. Give respect so you get respect. If 70% of people remembered this, there wouldn't be nearly as many fights. Think, what would your family say? As a big part is as parents, adults need to be there for the children. Though my mother couldn't take care of herself, much less a child, she always tried to care for me. Though this isn't the best, she worked at a gentleman's club and she split up half of the money for drugs and half of the money for me. But she loved me and she showed it somehow. Teachers should always teach the benefits and practices of leading a nonviolent lifestyle. Without this, students may never learn, considering most of us assume we already know. Know that youth violence has caused 738,000 young people ages 10 to 24 to be treated with assault-related injuries, according to the CDC. Though youth violence is a, is a huge problem, we all know it is, I feel we can come together and reduce the percent of violent teens. Okay. Every day, <clears throat> sorry. Every day, wherever I go, whether it is the mall, school, or movies, I experience violence. Though the level of violence I experience may be very minor, like a dispute between neighbors, there are much worse cases of violence around the world. In my opinion, the biggest issue of violence is Islamic terrorism. I believe terroristic violence is a result of religious and cultural misunderstandings between different diverse groups. These differences have led to so much violence. <clears throat> for example, Al-Qaeda's purpose is to destroy America, for they believe the way of America governs and their standard of living was unjust or unrighteous. They have no idea how great a place America is to live and raise a family. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, one sec. Okay. They have no idea how great a place America is to live and raise a family. So they carried out 9-11 to show America that they were superior and to try and break America. Can you imagine having a loved one killed for no reason at all? That's what thousands of Americans had to go through that day. Even though I did not lose a loved one, my life was changed forever. How could someone in the name of my faith, Islam, do something so terrible? I know from what my parents and religious teachers have taught me was that Islam is a religion of peace, acceptance, and respect. My dad has always taught me to try and understand and respect people's differences of faith. Instead of practicing Islam as it was meant to, or respecting the differences between American culture and their own twisted view of Islam, Osama bin Laden, leader of Al-Qaeda, 
considered his culture superior, and on 9-11, Al-Qaeda carried out their attacks on the Twin Towers. Being an American Muslim, these terrorist groups are impacting my life greatly. At school, I would always get bullied and teased because of my religion. Towel head, camel jockey, and other more vulgar names have been told, or more like yelled at me. When walking through the mall, people would stare at my family and give us dirty looks because of my mother's headscarf. We even flew an American flag, but many people in our neighborhood would still give us dirty looks. Did they not realize that I am as upset about what happened also? These terrorist groups are attacking my complete way of life. I am an American and Muslim. Just as Al-Qaeda is not trying to understand America's way of life, a lot of people here are guilty of the same thing also. The television, news, and newspapers are selling headlines, only worried about getting ratings, but not caring that they are misinforming the public. If people would research the religion on their own, they would realize that these terrorists are crazy people acting barbarically, hiding under the banner of Islam, just like the KKK hid under the banner of Christianity. I know that no God-fearing Christian would agree with the KKK. Despite all these hardships I go through, I never stop being a proud American and a strong practicing Muslim. And please don't get me wrong, there were a lot of good people who provided support and stuck up for my family. I realize that I can't stop the violence that is happening, but I can try being a bridge between Muslims and Americans' misunderstandings. Having an understanding of both the American way of life and Islam, I am in the perfect position to teach both Americans and Muslims. It is my job to properly explain and teach people that Islam is not the enemy, but the crazy people who are committing violent acts under the misrepresented view of Islam. Also, I can explain and teach Muslims how great this country is to live in and the freedom that we have. It is in this freedom that has made practicing Islam so great in America. I can only imagine what would happen to me if I were to express these thoughts as a student in the Middle East. I can also help start interfaith conferences where all types of people can get together and learn about each other. I know that these violent terrorist groups will always be around, but I will do my best to try and teach people that there are better ways to live. Thank you. Uh, last one standing by Fabiola Palomo. Waking up, stepping out with fear, around the corner, bullets can interfere. I see my five friends, they say hello, a car passes by, I yell down low. It goes away and no one is hurt, our knees and faces covered with dirt. Waking up, stepping out with fear, around the corner, bullets can interfere. I see my four friends, they say hello, the fifth one is out, making easy money. Our minds are confused, but I stand my ground, I'm not thinking of going that way around. Waking up, stepping out with fear, around the corner, bullets can interfere. I see my three friends, they say hello, the fourth one didn't make it home. Our minds are set, we need to survive. But I'm thinking further of how to get out alive. Waking up, stepping out with fear, around the corner, bullets can interfere. I see my two friends, they say hello, the third one is out in the war. One side is black, the other is white. The two colors that can't seem to combine. No one knows why they can't think alike. Our minds are tired, but have not surrendered. We wonder if we'll make it out uninjured. Waking up, stepping out with fear. Around the corner, bullets can interfere. I see my friend, he says hello. The second one is in jail, and the reason? No one knows. The police said he committed a felony, but didn't specifically say what. Our minds are convinced the authority isn't with us. Not all are bad, but nor are they good. I can't say they all do a good job like the way they should. Waking up, stepping out without care, or not around the corner, anything can happen. I see none of my friends, no one but me. I am the last one standing, but weak. I am convinced I will fall until I look into the eyes of the person reading this now. My last chance of hope. My last chance of survival. A cry help for help will not do. No one will listen except maybe you.
thank you to the four students who read. I know that took a lot of courage in front of this many people to share a very personal part of your life with us, and we do thank you for, for sharing that and for your insight into what the problems of uh, violence are doing to um, youth in America. Mr. David Esquith is the director of the Office of Safe, Safe and Healthy Students. His office is in the Department of Education, and he reports to the Secretary of Education, who is Secretary Arnie Duncan. Mr. Asquith has been the director there for several years. Prior that, to that, he served in the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services. And something that I learned about David several years ago is that when he had his business cards created, he actually had them printed in, in Braille so that it would, when he gave them out, it would bring attention to this area of education. And I thought that was a pretty cool idea. He has worked as a special education teacher, an administrator, a lobbyist, a congressional aide, and a Peace Corps volunteer in North Africa, which he says was the best two years of his life. He said he thought that because he didn't have a care in the world. But I think he enjoyed that time so much because in the Peace Corps, he was fully engaged in serving others. And this service from the time of the Peace Corps until now is something that has been a hallmark of David's career. So David? Uh, thank you and good morning to everyone. And um, as I was coming in on the train this morning, I, I was remembering this is my fourth year of, uh, uh, of doing this, and it really is a pleasure. And I've read through all of the essays. Um, I, I really admire and congratulate all of you. Um, the essays are so candid, so honest, and, and the resilience of all of you is, is, is just quite admirable. So I want to congratulate all of you um, and to, uh, um, to share a few thoughts, um, some, a few thoughts on character. And I wouldn't be in the Department of Education if I didn't start with a bit of a quiz. I know it's summer break, but um, this, is a, this is a quiz that, or just a question that'll give you a little insight into perhaps who you are or kind of what, what character you have. And so, you know, it, it's a bit of a parlor game. Um, the, the question is, if you had a superpower, you, you can have a superpower and I'm giving you two choices. Um, you can be invisible or you can fly. Okay, so think about that for a moment. Um, you can have a superpower, you can be invisible or you can fly. Um, just want to take a poll, a, a raise of hands. How many people would like to be uh, invisible? Raise your hand. A lot of adults, and, and I think that probably has something to do with, uh, with the kids. Um, as, as a parent of two nine-year-olds, uh, uh, for any number of reasons, I often wish that I were invisible, both not to be there as well as to, uh, to find out what's going on. And then how many people would, uh, would prefer to fly? Yeah, lots of kids, uh, lots of young people. All right, so, so when, when you process this question, what, what you're doing is thinking about kind of who you are, and if you had this superpower, what, what would life would be like, and how good it would feel. So we all have, everyone has a, a unique character. And I'm going to run through some, uh, some slides on character, and there are some questions built in here. And I think there's, there's one question at the end that I really want you to, uh, uh, to come away with and think about. And I want to credit uh, two people. I want to credit uh, Tiffany Schlein, um, who, uh, uh, is the, uh, the, I, the, the kind of the founder of the Moxie Institute. And there, there's a film called The Science of Character. I encourage you all to, uh, to go online. You'll see a lot of the, uh, the concepts from my presentation today from that film. And I also want to credit a person, someone who's been here for four years, who's seen some of my uh, presentations before, and I see some familiar faces, um, will know that this is really an upgrade for me in terms of my slide presentation. And I want to credit Eric Cherwin. Eric, can you stand up for a moment? Um, who's with the Department of Education this summer. <clears throat> for, uh, so you'll see that I couldn't have done these. I, I don't know how Eric did it. but um, So we're going to talk a little bit about character. And the question is, well, what determines character? What determines who we are um, as people? And uh, uh, there are a lot, there, there, people and science and philosophers have been kind of asking this question for an awful long time. 
And there's some new thinking on it, and some thinking that um, I think has a lot of implications for stopping violence and preventing violence and, and how we treat each other. Um, and the answer is you do. Um, you determine your character. Um, and it is a, uh, uh, a very powerful, powerful idea that you have control over the kind of person um, who you are. Um, the other component to this is that the people around you help determine your character. And the converse to that is that you help determine the character of other people by the way that you interact with them. Um, and so the idea here is that if you focus on certain parts of who you are, you can develop your character. We all have many different parts, right? We all are good, we all are bad, we have good moments, we had bad moments, things we're proud of, things we're ashamed of. Um, and the, the part of this comes down to on what you focus on as a person. Um, for a long time, and this is still kind of prevalent in a lot of the ways that we deal with, uh, with people, um, and particularly people at school and, and issues around disruption, is we focus on what's wrong with someone. What's the problem? What's wrong with that person? Um, how can we fix what's wrong with them? And in 2004, Christopher Peterson and, and Martin um, Selgeman, um, came up with a kind of a, a different paradigm. Um, and it's not something that was totally new, but they, 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 they said, why don't we focus on what's right with a person? When we're talking to a person, why don't we focus on their strengths and what's right with them? And what impact will that have on, uh, uh, on how society deals with, uh, uh, with everyone in the society? Um, and so scientists being what they are, um, came up with a table. Science kind of organizes things by tables, right? And so there was a, a periodic table of character strengths. And I want you to kind of take a look at the headings across the table um, and then take a look at the, uh, the parts underneath and start thinking about yourself. What are your strengths um, under these categories? And the categories are wisdom, courage, humanity, justice, temperance, and transcendence. And so take a look at kind of the boxes. I hope you can all, can everybody see those? Are they, um, uh, but the, I, I don't want to take up too much time going through all of them, but um, under those categories, think of your strengths. Think of people in your life and their strengths that fit under these categories. And what science has learned is that there are seven that really keep coming up over and over again in terms of people who are successful and happy. And those seven are optimism, gratitude, social intelligence, curiosity, self-control, enthusiasm, and perseverance. And that people who have one or more of these qualities and who focus on strengthening those qualities are the people who are more likely to become successful and happy. So think about, again, those parts of yourself where you have one or more of those characteristics. Think about other people that you know and think about ways, and here's one of the keys here, of what you can do to increase that, to improve that, to build out um, those character traits. So, um, <laughs> this is, see, this is Eric. I, I, never, I never would have come up with this slide. I, I, I got to give Eric credit here. Um, and so, we're all, I mean, we're, we're, we're all kind of this, this patchwork quilt, but everyone has a, a unique combination of traits. And if we focus on building strengths, then that has a lasting impact. If we focus on what are the strengths of this person? So I'm the principal, some kid comes down, he's been sent down to the, uh, the principal's office, he's disrupted the class. What happens when the principal goes, I know, I know this student. What are his strengths? What can we do to kind of improve his strengths? Then we end up having a much more lasting impact in our interactions with people 
than if we start working on what's the problem, what's wrong with them, what do I need to do to fix what's wrong. <clears throat> and we help shape others' characters too. So this is again this idea that it's not just us, but what we do as we interact with people um, help shape their character. And that the key to human relationships is appreciating other strengths. And I'll let that sink in for a moment because it's really quite a, quite a kind of a profound thought about genuinely appreciating other people's strengths, people who we don't like, people who rub us the wrong way, um, where, there, where there's friction, where there's kind of conflict. What happens if the lens that we look through is about well, what are the strengths of this person and what can I do to kind of appreciate them? And so if you improve your character through mindful striving or let your character worsen through negligence and obliviousness, then what we know is that happiness comes from practicing virtuous character strengths. And this idea of practicing them is very real. How do we practice character strengths? And, and, and I'll give you an example. And this is kind of something that, it's an exercise that I go through living in Washington on, on a regular basis. Um, it is, and, and, it's, and it's little moments like these where we're really kind of practicing our character strengths. But in Washington, unfortunately, there are a lot of homeless individuals. There are a lot of individuals who are out asking for money, who are panhandling. And um, it always makes me uncomfortable. Um, I'm always faced with kind of a moral dilemma when I see these individuals on the street of, do I take out a dollar and give it to them? And um, this is kind of where my character is surfacing. These are kind of the little moments in the course of the day where your character is surfacing. And, and I, I, I've, I've always struggled with this. It's that, it's that you know, kind of typical dilemma. Well, if I give them a dollar, am I reinforcing this behavior? Am I, you know, I, I start going through all these mental exercises of, is this the right thing to do? Um, you know, this person, am I encouraging them? I, I, don't, I don't want, you know, they're making me uncomfortable. That's not right. They're invading my space. Just a, you know, in, in just a moment's time, you go through this kind of continuum of emotions about something that is basically pretty simple. And I was in a course in a, in a, in a, in, um, at, our, at our synagogue, and, and the rabbi was talking about this, and, and what he said was that part of the Jewish tradition in terms of giving um, alms to the poor is that you should always do it when you least want to do it that at that moment, when this is the last person that you want to give a dollar to or some money to who is begging for money, that's when you should give it to them. And, I, and I've tried to live by that, and it's just kind of one of those moments, as I said, in the course of the day, when our real character not only kind of exhibits itself, but it's a kind of a, an opportunity to develop it an opportunity to do something that uh, kind of fits within those seven categories that I they identified earlier. So, um, what's kind of going back to the science here? There's a science that, you know, we, there's kind of a fixed mindset and there's a growth mindset that we're all kind of, once we're born and through the first kind of the formative years of our lives, we are who we are. We are who we're going to be. Um, there's another, I think, approach to this, which, is, which really resonates with me, which is to have a growth mindset, that every day, every day, no matter how old you are, no matter what your circumstances are, you can grow as a person, that we all can grow as a person. <clears throat> and so with a fixed mindset, as I said, it's kind of belief that we're born with certain abilities, intelligence, and talents, and we're stuck with it. And I, I think a lot of people believe that. A lot of people, when they deal with other people, particularly people who they're having a conflict with, they go, that's who that person is, and it's not going to change, and I'm writing them off. Um, the growth mindset is, I can change. If I set my mind to it, I can do anything. And that even failure for me is something that I can learn from. 
and that we can all develop. So, you know, again, going back to the science, they're, they're, they're kind of, as they're studying the brain, there's a lot of interesting brain science coming out these days. They talk about kind of executive functions. And there's a part of a brain where, you know, we've got organizing and prioritizing and sustaining effort and accessibility and uh, memory and recall and focusing on tasks and managing frustration and emotions and self-regulating actions. And that this part of the brain is dynamic. It is constantly changing, constantly growing. And so here's an adage that I, that I hope you'll kind of uh, keep in mind because again, kind of our own personal experience, how many of us kind of perseverate on things? Just kind of, there's this movie going on in our head of something bad that's going on in their lives. And we spend an awful lot of time kind of playing this movie over and over again. And the takeaway here is that that has an effect on you. It has an effect on who you are and the character that you have. And so this adage is that you need to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And so when you kind of follow this sequence of just beginning with your thoughts and what we're thinking about and what we're focusing on and the ability to kind of stop those movies that are negative, that are focusing on what's wrong, what the, what the problem is with someone, rather than the movie of, well, what are their strengths? What are my strengths? What can I do to kind of grow my strengths? Um, by the time you kind of finish the, uh, the sequence of events, um, your character kind of determines your destiny and kind of the journey that we're all on in life and, and where we end up. And, you know, I'm, I, quite frankly, I'm grateful that the journey that I'm taking has given me the opportunity to present to people like you, to, to be exposed to kind of the, uh, the courageous good work that you do. And so all of us have control of our destiny, and sometimes it just begins with our, our thoughts and our words. So character strengths can be learned, practiced, and cultivated. That's a takeaway here. Focusing on your strengths makes them stronger. Focusing on your strengths makes them stronger. Focusing on other strengths makes them stronger too. And then the final thought, the, uh, the, the question that I try to ask myself on kind of a regular basis throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of every small interaction that I have with other people, because that's, that's really kind of who I am, right? We all are kind of the, uh, the aggregation of every small moment in our lives. And so the, the question that really um, I encourage you to ask yourself, to take a moment and think, is is what I'm about to do a reflection of who I am and who I want to be? And if you do that, then I can encourage you to think that we'll all be a lot happier and safer and it'll be a better world for all of us to live in. So thank you again for this opportunity. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.